All right, thanks, y'all. Is this on? Is this on? Yeah, there it goes. No, okay, this works. All right, uh, hey everyone. Uh, so I'm Daniel, and today we're going to be talking about detection as code. Is it a buzzword or is it the panacea, the cure to all the evils that you've been facing when it comes to, you know, monitoring your systems? So that changed the slides. Perfect. All right, so here's what we're going to kind of cover over the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, we're going to talk about what is detection as code. Provide some bit of background there, so we're sort of all on the same page. Uh, we're going to talk about sort of a maturity level, so this framework uh, that sort of we're using at our company. Uh, to understand like what does it mean to get better as detection as code. Uh, talk about some of the resources that are necessary to be successful when it comes to implementing this in your organization. Really try to answer the question, you know, is this right for you? Lay out some groundwork, some frameworks to understand like should I even bother with detection as code? Is it just a buzzword to me? Uh, we'll talk about how to get started, some of the technologies that are needed, some of the resources. And then I'll go into sort of a demo, uh, not live, I don't trust my live demos anymore, uh, sort of demonstrating where even in the past few weeks our organization was able to significantly improve the fidelity of a detection by abiding by these principles. Uh, so who am I? I'm Daniel. I've been doing threat detection at Snowflake for about three years now. Uh, before that I was more on the red team side, offensive security, uh, doing consulting and some time in the military. Uh, swapped to blue team to fight the good fight, been really enjoying it. Uh, you can find me enjoying my computers, coffee, or cats. So it's 5 o'clock in Miami. If you want to get out of here, this is kind of really the one slide you need. Um, the thing I really want to emphasize is detection as code is not really a binary thing. You can be doing detection as code in a variety of different areas in your organization with different levels of maturity or success. Uh, I really want you to understand at the end of this what better looks like or how you can go about getting better at detection as code. And then you should also, at the end, understand what are some of the benefits and what are some of the costs. And how do you determine if it's right for you and where you need to be improving on. So let's start by defining, you know, what is detection as code? And like most good things these days, we turn to ChatGPT. Uh, so there's this, you know, definition that it's spat out. But the general gist of it is that you're going to be abiding by software development principles when it comes to developing and managing your rules. So it sounds pretty simple enough. Um, but uh, there's a lot of benefits that you can get from this that we'll cover, uh, but there's costs as well. So sort of wanted to throw up a slide of, you know, what a sample, you know, pipeline could look like. All the way from on the left, you have your data sources, maybe your cloud providers, maybe your CRM systems, maybe your authentication systems, all being fed and enriched. Uh, that's pretty standard so far. Uh, the difference lies with detection as code. Your threat detection engineers, the people writing the rules, are going to be pushing changes to GitHub or GitLab or some other sort of code repository system, and those changes will get propagated to your SIM rather than somebody going in directly and managing things in a GUI. Uh, the other thing that I'm adding here and sort of including in this world of detection as code is that enrichment step on the right before stuff hits your case management system. And I'll be talking about these integrations and enrichments and why I believe they're a part of the detection engineering world. So now we're going to sort of cover some of these maturity levels. And what I'm proposing here is a framework for understanding how and where you should be growing when it comes to detection as code. So I sort of laid out four different levels because four seems like a nice number and it's made sense when it comes to how we mature. You can go from ad hoc, uh, structured, automated, and optimized. And within those four, there's sort of four different functional areas in which you can grow. So you have language. What language are you writing your rules in? That can be something very basic to maybe a fully functional language. How are you testing your rules? And with what quality are you testing them? So like, are you looking at just you know, testing for coverage? Are you testing for, is the rule working? Are you testing your, your systems? Uh, integrations and automations, and all the different ways that those can be incorporated in your rules. And then monitoring, how well are you monitoring your systems? And especially as you grow in the other three areas, monitoring becomes increasingly important because the complexity of your systems will grow and the amount of opportunities for failures to occur will increase. So I found that this was sort of better represented visually. So we have you know, our four levels on the left and our four functional areas on the right. And over the this, this next section, we're gonna fill this matrix in and sort of understand how each of these areas, you know, what it looks like. So starting with language, there's sort of three you know, basic areas that you can be writing your detection as code. You can have some sort of basic YAML or some sort of basic text format, a query language, and then functional languages. 
So with YAML, you're going to be sort of limited in your expressiveness or the ways that you can search your logs. Uh, but it, the trade-off comes with complexity. This is pretty easy to read. Almost anyone can get started with this. If you know what the log looks like and you know what you're looking for, you can generate a role in five minutes. The other advantage is it's you know pretty human readable. That's kind of what YAML was designed to be. So anybody who's reading through this can pretty easily ascertain, oh, I'm looking for two different events in my AWS logs, and here's why I'm looking for it. The next level would uh, we're calling query languages. So this is going to be your Splunk processing language, your SQL queries, etc. These languages are better designed to search high volume logs, you know, parse your databases. Uh, you're going to get you know better performance when it comes to you know maybe petabytes of data when you're using these languages in the appropriate systems. The trade-off comes with accessibility and complexity. I don't know how many people can just parse that SPL and instantly tell what's going on. I am not one of them. Um, but you get more power at the cost of that, that additional complexity. And then finally, we have functional languages. Um, again, you're going to increase complexity, but the power that you get from these languages also goes up. So I really like this example because it's using a gray noise library and importing that in order to call some function that that library provides to look up some IP. So rather than you having to reinvent the wheel, you can just say, oh, let's import this gray noise library, call it on this IP, and carry on our way. One of the other downsides with Python, though, or other functional languages, is the tooling that's out there to support these is pretty limited right now. There's not a lot of you know, vendors that are offering stuff in this space. So filling in our matrix, this is kind of what we're looking at. YAML, maybe ad hoc, query languages at um, structured, functional languages at automated, and then optimized, you're really looking at using all of the above or picking the best tool for the job. So there's an example that I want to highlight here of something we did recently. We were building a detection to analyze our AWS logs to see if a user uh, was being used with multiple user agents. Because that can mean like, oh, this key's compromised. We see it coming from some sort of CLI, and we also see it coming from some sort of, you know, uh, maybe something more hard-coded, something scanning, whatnot. Uh, the issue comes then if you're looking maybe at like the Bodo library or what people are using to call AWS commands, they can be very, very similar but maybe off by a version. So if somebody updates their computer the next day, all of a sudden you're going to have two different user agents. So what we were able to do is in Python write a string similarity function and say if something is very, very similar, then we won't actually send that detection through or we won't send that alert. So we're able to parse our logs with SQL and then add on additional Python enrichment in part of that detection to uh, really combine the powers of both languages and using the best tool for the job. So now let's talk about some testing. Um, we're not going to go into all these areas, but testing is very, very important, especially as we move away from editing things in the GUI to writing sort of more complex codes and detections. So with unit testing, it's pretty straightforward. You want to make sure the detection actually works. You want to have some sort of sample log, run it against your detection, and see if you get the output you expect, maybe a true positive or a true negative. Uh, linting is especially important when it comes to you know, onboarding users. Then you're going to be looking for code quality and clean code. Performance can depend on the system, but that's essentially saying, you know, is this query running as I would expect? Is it running in time? Is it not costing me too much? Integration, again, you're looking at if I'm integrating with other systems, maybe taking back to that gray noise provider, uh, are those integrations working correctly? Maybe my API goes down and I want to be able to test that that's occurring. Or I'm calling some API in the wrong way and I want to make sure that I spot that before I push something to production. And then end-to-end -end is going to be all the way from data source generation to your case management system. And that's going to be the most complex and most challenging one, but it can tell you a lot about is everything actually hooked together correctly. So looking at this uh, unit testing example, uh, this is, as I said, probably the most important because you're looking for detection correctness. You don't really want to push a detection that doesn't work because either you're going to overwhelm your SOC with a bunch of false positives or you're going to miss the behavior that you were trying to look for. So in this one, we have this detection that's looking for five different AWS discovery events. And on the right, we have a sort of sample log event. And the expected result at the top, in this case, we're looking for a true positive. Now, linting, I think, is a very undervalued aspect of testing. Um, readability is maintainability. If you have somebody writing this SQL on the left with all sorts of casing and spacing, and maybe it's 100 lines long, it's going to be very hard to maintain that code, especially if the author you know, moves on or is sick. So 
on the right, we can see that when we run a linter against this, this code, there's, what, about one error per line? So it's not very good code. And a good linter will also be able to auto-fix some code for you. And then the most challenging is gonna be end-to-end -end testing. A lot of organizations are using things like breach and attack simulation tools, where they're able to run some attack maybe on an endpoint or in some cloud system, and then double check that they're actually seeing the alert at the end. One of the hard parts with using end-to-end -end testing is it can be tricky to figure out where stuff broke. So let's say you run this breach and attack simulation tool and you don't get the alert. Well now you have to troubleshoot maybe your ingest, your enrichment, your SIM, your case management system. That's why it's pretty challenging to use because there's a lot of different things that you have to be able to troubleshoot if stuff is breaking. And now a key aspect of testing is you want to automate your tests. If you run a test just you know every once in a while when you remember, you're gonna miss things. So you can use things like GitHub Actions or equivalents in GitLab or other CI CD providers to run tests automatically whenever code changes. So if you're wondering like, well, what's the most important? What do I start with? This is kind of our experience of you know what is sort of the most important testing, as well as the expected difficulty of implementing those tests. For performance and integration testing, it's kind of gonna really depend on what suite of tools you're running. Uh, and how many integrations you have incorporated in your tech stack. So again, now that we've got our matrix filled in a little bit more, um, with ad hoc, you're pretty much not gonna be testing or you're gonna have minimal testing whenever somebody remembers to do it. When structured, you maybe have some testing in all areas, but it's maybe not very good, or you have really strong testing in some areas. By automated, you should have testing in all areas and ideally strong capabilities in a few. And another thing I wanna highlight is, especially when it comes to testing, you should start looking at having some sandbox or development environment where you can run your detections prior to them hitting your queue. A uh, good example of this is I was working on you know, this detection actually for the user agent thing I mentioned, and I had uh, called some Python function wrong. So even though it worked when I was running it you know, by hand, when I pushed it into this test queue, it started breaking. Uh, but fortunately, I spotted that you know, before I got peer review or before it hit the live queue. And then for optimized, you really should be looking at code coverage in all areas and requiring tests before something hits production. So integration. I have strong opinions on this that perhaps differ from others. So detection automation versus incident response automation. There's this whole theory of like, you know, who builds this stuff that automates things, right? My worldview is that if our goal as detection engineers is to make the response process as easy as possible. Anytime somebody has to switch systems or go into another window or bug somebody for some information in order to determine if something was malicious or not, that slows them down. Uh, it impedes their, uh, you know, from a monitoring perspective, your mean time to respond goes down. From a human perspective, it creates friction and it bugs people. They're like, I wanna go do what I'm good at. I don't wanna go bug Bob about his VPN login. So my philosophy is that detection engineers should be working as hard as possible to add as much context to a detection so somebody who's human can go be smart and go do things that only a human can do. An instant response should be automating their response and recovery actions as part of that. Obviously it's gonna depend on your organization and your staffing, but that's kind of my philosophical tangent on that. So I've broken out sort of three different categories of integrations. Uh, you can either integrate to reach out to another system to generate an alert, to suppress an alert, or to enrich an alert. And enriching is really one that you have to be careful with, right? Because you don't wanna dump a whole bunch of information on somebody, and you don't wanna just say, well, I got you the information, now it's your turn to figure out what to do with it. This would be sort of a last resort where, you know, we wanna give you more information, but we can't do anything with it to suppress or send an alert. So here's an example of a very common suppression thing, the was this you? This is something folks ask all the time, you know, reaching out to a user like, hey, did you do this thing? Did you approve this ticket? Did you send this command, et cetera? So we have an example of a, you know, impossible travel VPN login here. And, you know, sometimes it is legitimate. Sometimes someone did go to Egypt, maybe something broke, and your calculations for impossible travel were off. So you'd wanna reach out to this person before deactivating their account. And you can say, well, if they clicked yes, this was me, we'll just suppress it and move on. Or if they click no or don't respond in time, then we can conduct our automated response actions. This enrichment one, I think, requires a little bit of some background. 
So AWS offers this thing with instances where you can specify in this user data commands to run when an instance starts up. Very, very useful for automating program installs, automating you know, updates on instance starts. Also very useful for persistence or for getting access to an instance automatically. A good way to hop from like, oh, I have access to AWS to I have access to your compute nodes now. So because developers use this for automation though, it's not uncommon for them to put keys in these things. So AWS did the very helpful thing of saying when somebody modifies this user data, we're just gonna strip the logs. So you can't actually see what happened. So if you're trying to monitor, excuse me, monitor for malicious user data, you kind of have to go with a manual route. In this case, you, you know, can run this AWS uh, command to pull down the user data. This slows down instant response though, right? This adds friction to their process. And also it means that now your SOC has to have a bunch of AWS keys lying around so they can pull stuff from the instance if whenever they get this alert. And imagine if you have 50 AWS accounts, every time you onboard somebody, you now need to provision 50 new AWS keys. So by automating this, you can say, if I see this detection, let me now coordinate with this service account I've set up, pull this user data, add it to the detection context, and then send it on to the incident response team. The SOC gets all the information they need, and you don't have to provision a whole bunch of keys. So again, filling in our matrix a little bit more, no or minimal integrations. Maybe you have some integrations set up, but setting up new integrations is difficult. Automated, you at least have a process in place, and you can automate and enrich for key detections. And then optimize, you have a lot of integrations, a lot of suppressions, easy to get things set up, and you're in a good state. So monitoring really emphasizes the engineering part of detection engineering. As we sort of abide by these software development processes, it becomes more and more important that we understand how our systems are doing and can take proactive or even automated things to sort of get them back if things are breaking. So kind of have broken out three different categories of monitoring. Input, or what data are you getting into your sim? Execution, so is everything sort of running correctly? Are your performance issues, are there cost issues? and then outputs, which is what are you actually sending to the SOC? So data quality is not super sexy. I won't spend a whole lot of time on this, but I will say that this is perhaps one of the biggest banes of, uh, or biggest problems that folks deal with sometimes, depending on your org. Are you not getting the data that you need? Maybe you're missing AWS accounts, or you're missing hosts, and you're not able to determine that. Maybe logs are coming in two days late, and it's impeding your ability to respond in time. Maybe you don't know who to go to if something breaks. Maybe you know right away, but you're like, well, who owns this system? What do I do when stuff breaks? So having uh, data quality in place and having automation, documentation for all these things will really help improve the quality of your detections. Execution, so performance and cost, you really don't want to figure out that something's breaking when you get the bill. Uh, especially with some of these, you know, if you're working in cloud or some of these vendors, you can get some very high bills. So knowing when something is, you know, a query that was supposed to take a second is now taking an hour. Uh, being proactive with that kind of monitoring, either through dashboards or through automated notifications, is gonna be very important for the quality of your systems. And then failure handling as well. Let's, stuff goes down, stuff breaks, it's, it's what happens. When that happens, can you tell that it happens? More importantly, can you recover from that happening and automatically rerun your queries or detections over that time period? so that you can resume operations and be like, yep, we lost stuff for an hour, but we were able to recover. Nobody had to do anything, we're back on, back on top. And then monitoring your outputs. Um, you don't want to have the SOC or your instant response team come banging at your door and saying, why did you send us 50,000 of these alerts? It's important as you mature to say like, we should be proactively monitoring what we're sending out. Just like Google doesn't wait for a phone call to 1-800-GOOGLE to know that stuff is breaking, you should also be sort of saying like, oh, we just sent a thousand alerts. Is that right? We should take a look at what's going on with these systems. So again, filling in this matrix now. Um, ad hoc monitoring, you get told by the SOC when stuff is broken and you find out about data outages during an incident response when you're like, oh, we never had those logs in the first place. Uh, structured, you're gonna have some dashboards and visualizations. Maybe somebody checks them once a day to see what's going on. Automated, you're gonna start having notifications in place and some SLAs or SLOs saying, hey, we'll fix these things by this time. Data will be fixed by this time. And then optimize, you maybe start looking at like automated suppressions. So maybe if something fires a thousand times, we pull it down from production. You're gonna have data contracts in place and be able to recover when things break. 
So we kind of struck through or walked through now, like what is detection as code? How do we grow from it? But what do you need to do to actually do that? Well, like most things, you know, you do cost benefit analysis. What's it going to cost for me to be able to implement some of these things? And what are the benefits? Do I need to be fully optimized in all areas? Well, how would you even know if what to benefit? There's sort of four areas that we've broken out to say, like, you know, these are the things that, are, that would allow you to benefit from detection as code. Detection really is a function of risk management, right? Detection is great, but you really love to be able to, you know, prevent things. But all this comes back from having a well-structured risk management program. Do you even know what risks you're trying to monitor, what you are preventing? So being able to understand and how your risks are prioritized is really important to be able to say like, oh, I understand that this risk will cost me $10 million if it's you know, realized, therefore this investment is worth it. Are your threats evolving? And this kind of relates to the bottom one about dynamic environment. One of the benefits of detection as code is sort of the flexibility and the speed that it can offer. If your threats are ever changing, then you may want to say like, ah, you know, there's a dynamic environment in which I'm operating. I'm making a lot of changes to my systems. I could benefit from detection as code. Similarly, like, are you changing internally? If you're a startup deploying, you know, new systems every day, new tooling, you're going to have a lot of things where you're like, oh, I need to get this in, I need to get this in, I need to make detections for this. Whereas if you're, you know, maybe an ICS system like our last talk, not a lot of stuff is changing. You can maybe don't need to have that kind of rapid response or the ability to manage a whole lot of different detections. And then, do you even really need that much in-house development? Is your risk such that you're like, well, you know, the threats that we're facing, the environment that we're in, maybe we're not that special and we can go with an MSSP and have them build a lot of our detections. Maybe we don't need that much in-house capability. Maybe we just need the two folks monitoring our endpoint detection and response. And then so costs. Talent is going to be probably the biggest one here, both in terms of how much you're paying for them and what they're doing with that time. So finding security engineers can be pretty expensive. Finding security engineers who are good coders can be even more expensive. In addition to that, if they're supporting detection as code, that means they're not actually doing other things, right? So we had somebody who has been working for about a month on making some updates to our systems to support some better analytics. That's a month that's not being spent writing detections. That's a month not spent doing other things. Infrastructure costs as well. Some of these detection as code systems, you know, you, maybe you can't find an open source off the shelf version. There's going to be costs from paying vendors. There's going to be costs from also running this infrastructure. And then priorities. This is kind of related to that first point, right, about time. Is this really the most important thing that your team should be doing? Maybe SOC compliance is the most important thing right now. And you're like, well, we have pretty good detections. We're going on OK. Maybe we don't need to spend you know, a quarter getting this implemented. So how do you know if it's right for you? I wanted to include this meme because it's all over the place right now, and I found it funny. Um, on the right, you have somebody who's saying, Editing detections in the GUI is good. And they're saying this because they've made the clear determination that detection as code is not right for my organization. I don't need it. I don't need the benefits. We are a two-man shop. We just need to sort of get things up and running and minimize risk as best we can within our budget. In the middle, we have the folks who are saying detection as code is right for everybody, regardless of what's going on and regardless of your risks. I believe fully in this, and that's the best way possible. And on the left, we have someone who doesn't even know what detection as code is, and they're just happy to carry on their way. So to illustrate this, I kind of brought up you know, three, three different examples of three different orgs. And if you guys want to play along, we can, and try and see you know, if detection as code would benefit them. So in this first one, we have a startup. There's three total security employees in the organization, and they have EDR and SIM. Do we think they need to be fully optimized in detection as code? Probably not. They may benefit from some of it, but you know they don't need to be fully optimized in all areas. What about a large multinational organization? SOC is in multiple different countries for 24-7, different functions within the SOC, and they have hundreds of custom rules they're already managing. They probably need to be optimized in quite a few areas. What about this third example? So here we have a regulated financial company they have a 15-person security team, so decent size, but not huge. And they have a robust threat intelligence program. 
Do they need to be optimized in all areas? Probably not, but they would probably benefit from being optimized in some areas or being, you know, having detection as code in some places. One of the key, here, key pieces here, right, is regulated. Having the ability to audit changes is a huge benefit from detection as code, and regulators often ask, you know, what changes were made in these systems? How do you know if somebody disabled or edited a rule? Uh, oh yeah, I think these got out of order. Yeah. And then finally for an MSSP, uh, you know, you may be looking at being optimized in all areas because now it's not just one customer, maybe now you have dozens or hundreds of customers. So being able to be confident that what you're producing is of high quality is very, very important. So now you've figured out like, okay, I could benefit from detection as code in some areas. How do I go get started? There's three sort of technical components that you're gonna need in place. One, you need some sort of source code repository, somewhere where you're gonna store your detections as code. You need a rules engine or a sim, right? Something that is actually going to run your detections. And then you need some sort of automation or something that will actually get your detections from that source code repository into your sim in a way that's expected. So, I don't know how that slide sucked in there again. So now you want to choose an area and a level to focus on first, right? So when you're saying like, okay, now I've got these three things in place, I can push detections from my source code to my sim, where, where do I need to grow? Like I know there's these four functional areas, I know there's these four levels, what's sort of the most important for me to focus on? Well, there's some questions that you can consider here, right? Like what, you know, do I need better audibility? Do I need to know who's making changes to rules? Maybe I had an instance where somebody was making an edit that they thought would fix a false positive and it ended up just turning off the rules, so nothing would fire. Maybe I had a penetration test where the attacker snuck by and I was like, oh, well, we thought we had this detection for this, but it actually wasn't working. Maybe I need better testing in place. So you can sort of ask yourself these questions by analyzing sort of past incidents that have occurred, past misses, old cases that have popped up. Maybe you can talk to the SOC and they're like, yeah, you guys are sending us 500 garbage alerts a day. How are you even testing these things? So there's ways you can go get answers to these questions and then figure out like, does this align with better testing? Am I not monitoring what's going on? Am I like not able to write the rules that I need to write because I'm limited by my tooling? So now we're gonna hop into a, a demo of uh, some re pre-recorded sort of snapshots of some detection as code that we worked on in the past few weeks. And these sort of light blue boxes here highlight the areas that we're going to highlight. So this wasn't fully optimized in all areas. Um, I don't think our team is there yet, uh, but these are sort of the different areas that this demo will highlight. So starting off, root account usage. Um, the root account in AWS lets you do a lot of things. It's root, kind of like the root user on your Ubuntu box. AWS has some best practices for how to go about securing the root user. Some of those recommendations even include like just turning it off or disabling it or severely limiting access. So one of our detections is like, well, okay, we shouldn't be using root in our systems. If we see root, let's generate an alert. Seems pretty straightforward, right? So we have this from our actual logs. Uh, somebody was using root to run this get public sector customer contract command. I don't know what that is. So this was our old alert flow, pretty straightforward. If we see root usage, let's log it, and then let's generate an alert. The issue is that when this fired, there was a lot of friction for analysts to figure out like, well, who did this? Was it legitimate? How do we even know if it was legitimate? So one of the things that they would often go do is go talk to our cloud engineering team. And they would say like, hey, we saw this usage of root. Like, what's going on here? So in the top, we have a Slack message from one of these security engineers or one of these cloud engineers saying, hey, I'm doing this thing with root as part of our you know, operation to set up a new account. We'll do whatever and then we'll delete the thing. So that's great and all, but that now means somebody has to go into Slack, maybe do a search, maybe bug this engineer and say, hey, was this you doing this thing in this account? It adds a lot of friction, especially if you're s doing this automation maybe every day, maybe twice a week. So one of the other key parts of this that I want to highlight is clean integrations from your SOC or incident response team back to your detection engineers. This is our case management platform at the bottom. 
Uh, if you click on the left with Vuon Show, you can get to the case information, and all their notes, the actual alerts itself. But on the right, we have this option for them to create what we call a DIR, or a detection improvement request. So within their native platform, they can click this thing, and it sends all of the case information, all of their notes, back to us to be able to action. Again, you know, not having to switch systems keeps things clean and allows them to be able to track, you know, hey, I submitted something to get this fixed. So what pops up back in our ticketing system is this detection improvement request. We see like, hey, the incident response team said, you know, this alert's been firing and they think it's benign. Maybe it's, you know, the definition of a true positive, it did find root usage, but the usage was benign. So they want to see if we can submit this or suppress this detection. This also allows us to track the SLOs that I talked about before, where we're saying we're going to fix these things within a certain period of time. As soon as they click that, we have this ticket open, and then we should be fixing it, you know, ideally within two weeks, but hopefully sooner. So one of the things we wanted to figure out when we saw this detection request come in was, well, how often have we gotten detection improvement requests for this? So we have a dashboard that shows how many tickets or detection improvement requests were filed based on a certain detection for a given quarter. Unfortunately, this one popped up at the top. So they have submitted a lot of requests for fixes to this one within this quarter. So clearly we know that you know, one-off suppressions aren't really cutting it, that this is actually a pretty major blocker to their workflow. So this is, again, where like, integration comes into play as part of a detection engineer's responsibility. What we figured out from talking to the cloud engineering team is that when they do this root usage, there's a couple of scripts that they use in order to do what they need to do, right? They're not hand jamming stuff. They have automation scripts that they populate and then use whenever they are doing their root usage. So we're like, huh, if you're doing this automation anyways, why don't we just hook into that? So what we did was at the end of all of their automation scripts, we set up uh, a webhook that essentially said, when you're done, populate this script with the user, what the commands were run, what the output of that command was, what accounts were being modified, timestamps, IP addresses, and let's send that all over to a webhook so that when you're doing root usage, we get notified right away, and we now have that information as part of our detections. So before, this is some SQL code essentially saying, you know, select from our cloud trail logs, and if there's root, then there's root. After, though, we're able to do a join or say, like, let's correlate our cloud trail logs with this data we're getting from cloud engineering. And if we s we're going to join on the account. And if we see root usage and we also see cloud engineering root activity based on those automation scripts within this period of time, now we have additional data that we can use as part of our detection. In this case, we decided, you know, if they're within a proximal time period and we can... <laughs> And we can figure out, like, oh, the IP address from, like, our root is same to their machine. Then we can look at suppressing this, this detection. So then, now here's where testing comes into play. We were able to look through our historical data, and we said, well, when we ran this before with the old version, I think there was a couple hundred different rows there that had fired that I had to blur out. Afterwards, though, no hits. So clearly, we're able to look at our historical data and have that validate that everything's working. Another key component, though, right, is your sandbox or dev environment. You want to make sure that, you know, maybe it's just some luck, right? Maybe things were lining up. Maybe you were missing some things. So we were able to set up a sandbox version of this rule on the right, kind of suffixed with our ticket number that we had. On the left, we see that there was some hits on May 10th for the production version of this rule. But on the right, in our staging version, there were no hits. So now we have both the historical evidence and the live evidence that our changes worked. So now what? So now we actually make this change in a pull request in our code repository system. So one of the other advantages that these things or these systems can give is they can help sort of guide users on best practices as they step through this process. So we have this little template that we have here that says, you know, have you linked a ticket to the top of this document so that if somebody sees this pull request, they know what the change is supposed to be for? Have you followed some of the guidelines that we have in our contributing document? Has you passed all of the checks? And then we have some other ones specific, right? Like, is there proof of change in your ticket that this thing actually works? Have you been sort of cognizant about the information that you're providing to the engineers or the incident response team so they can action this? And then on the right, uh, we see that we actually have some automated tests that run as part of this. 
we build a couple things, we double check that linting passes, and we push it to our staging environment. And if all those things pass, then we can get a peer review who like reviews all this stuff, says checks passed, the test is good, let's carry on. The advantage of doing this pre-work is it makes it really easy for someone to be able to approve. They can just say, okay, the test passed, they submitted proof of change, it, kinda, it lines up with the description in the ticket, let's approve. And the approval process can take five minutes when somebody's picked up a ticket. So here's kind of what our new flow looks like. When we see root account usage, we're gonna log it, but we're also going to you know, have that script send data to our webhook. And that webhook will then, again, log that information back. From there, we can do that correlation and figure out, okay, do we need to suppress it or do we not? And some of the things that I wanna highlight as part of this were like, you know, these integrations that we had between the incident response team, our SOC, and us supported quick feedback. So we were able to action this you know, pretty quickly before they start getting overwhelmed. Our monitoring that we had about how many detection improvement requests were filed enabled us to make a larger strategic decision to say like, hmm, we really need to rethink how we're doing this detections. Our initial assumptions that we made about our behavior of our environment clearly weren't correct. Let's rethink what we're doing here. Uh, we were able to pretty easily set up this integration uh, and get things set up because we had webhooks already sort of pre-provisioned for us to send in data as needed. The testing framework provided evidence that changes were working. So we were able to quickly go through historical data as well as our sandbox environment and say, look, these things are working as expected. The automated tests helped with error checking. I didn't necessarily show all the mistakes I made along the way, but I'll just say this probably had 30 commits as part of the pull request uh, from various errors and steps that I made along the way. And then the code repositories helped support peer review and validation and change control as part of this. So that kind of sums up uh, the presentation. I hope you got a good idea of what detection as code is, some of the benefits, how you can go about implementing it, and you know, what it means to you know, get better as you mature through this process. So happy to take any questions now. If there's no questions, <laughs> bonus slide.